kids, my name is Ray Jane, and have you ever found yourself in a pickle like this? Fellas, fellas, I really want to hate myself! Then you should try out our selection of roguelikes. There's pain, misery, and a tumor. Need a little more convincing? Listen to this happy customer. <laughs> I fucking hate myself! Don't they just sound happy? What are you waiting for? Come down to store.steampower.com to wish you were never born today. Roguelikes are quite the genre. They're so unbelievably fun and addicting, but also painful. I have seen many people get sent to mental asylums after dying to Mega Satan a few too many times. I didn't lose my sanity playing roguelikes though. <laughs> I love roguelikes for the right and wrong reasons. They're like the voices in my head. They're funny, but they don't shut the fuck up. Roguelikes are games categorized by procedural generation and permadeath. And also pain. Minecraft Hardcore does fit into this definition, and so does real life. But roguelikes can be vastly different from game to game. You have the fast paced bullet hell shoot 'em up style of games like Enter the Gungeon, and also the slower, turn based strategic gameplay of Slay the Spire. But where did this beloved and absolutely despised genre start? Quick! We have to go back to the start of time! 1980. Humans were basically just invented. Jesus Christ, aka mass media, creators of the Bible game, started in the 80s. Pac-Man was released, Fortnite came out, my favorite little alien Germa 985 was born in 1985, just kidding, happy 800 years of Germa, and in the middle of all that, a little game called Rogue was released for the PC. Little did the developers of this game know that this game would start with some of the most important elements in gaming history that are still used to this day. But what is Rogue? Rogue is a turn-based strategy dungeon crawler game thing. Uh, you play as the at symbol in this game. That's right, idiot. You aren't a square or anything. And you explore dungeons and fight monsters, collecting items to make you more powerful, and when you die, you completely restart. Sound familiar? Rogue was the start of roguelikes. Kinda. There was a game called Beneath Apple Manor that released in 1978, and there was a few games earlier that included a lot of core gameplay elements of roguelikes, and is widely recognized as the first commercial roguelike. But Rogue is what really spawned the genre, hence the name Roguelikes. Hey, I wanted to really talk about uh, Beneath Apple Manor a little bit more in editing, because I realized that I didn't really talk about it much, and I think it deserves a little more recognition. I said that wrong, whatever, shut up. This game may have not been, like, super popular, um, but it does kinda start the roguelike genre, even though neither the creators of Rogue or the creators of Beneath Apple Manor really knew about you're the only game. This game is technically the first roguelike with, I mean, I guess some games a little bit earlier had some qualities of a roguelike, but this is kind of where it started. But roguelikes technically really started, I guess, in rogue, but I, I, I don't know. Okay, I'm not smart. I don't know thing rogue implemented that wasn't really supposed to change the gaming world, but did anyway is procedural generation. But let's go back even further and talk about the development of rogue. Rogue originated from the minds of Michael Toy and Glenn Witchman. Michael Toy's father was a nuclear scientist. Oh, my phone's ringing. I hope it's my 30 packs of limbs that I ordered. Hello? Nobody cares! Get to the fucking Rogue shit! No. Toy's father's workplace allowed the families of the employees to come in the workplace once a year. When Toy was there, he was allowed to play games on the computers there and he took particular interest in the 1971 Star Trek game. Toy went on to learn programming to recreate this game himself for other systems that he could access outside of the workplace, eventually going to college at UCSC. Toy began working to explore what games could be on the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the internet. I've always wanted to watch the prequel to the internet! This movie fucking reeks! <laughs> Toy was intrigued by another very influential game, Colossal Cave Adventure, also known as Adventure, released in 1976. This game is a story for another day, but it's widely considered to be the first text-based adventure game. Glenn Witchman enters the story after meeting Toy at UCSC. They were both working on their own adventure games. Witchman had also experimented with RPGs like D&D, and he went to UCSC to be a board game developer and he discovered computer science through UCSC. The two became good friends and eventually moved in together. When they were both developing their own games, they discovered a pretty big flaw in the adventure games they were playing. They fucking reeked every playability. Around the time, a new operating system was making the rounds in the University of California campuses, BSD Unix. BSD distribution was pretty important because of something called the Cursus Library, which was basically a graphical interface. So this monitor doesn't work, right? I'm gonna try something. Shit! It works! Who knew that you just had to curse at your monitor when it's not working? That would've saved me so much trouble. 
Toy and Witchman realized the potential this library had, and they created a few games to fuck around with the library. They eventually came up with a D&D style game, but they wanted to make a more replayable experience. They came up with a narrative where you explore the Dungeons of Doom, I prefer the Cavern of Chaos. You have to find the Amulet of Yendor, what the fuck is that? Toy was the more proficient programmer, well, Witchman was a stronger designer. Toy developed the game in C, and they came up with the idea to randomly generate dungeons every time the game started. This was for replayability, but also because a computer could only fit like 2GB of RAM inside of this fucking space shuttle. So to save space, they made it so no maps were saved and instead were random. That's right, without Rogue, there is no procedural generation. No Minecraft, no Minecraft, and no Minecraft. Oh yeah, and like... 90% of roguelikes and thousands of other games. I'm sure someone would have come up with this idea eventually, but the fact that it was done back in 1980 is pretty impressive. Mind you, this was before Mario, which invented video games. After making randomly generated dungeons, they went on to make equipment, monsters, and magic items. The effect of magic items were mysterious, providing a little more replay value. For the enemies, they wanted the AI to become more and more advanced as dungeons progressed. But this was 1980, and the memory on a Vax 11 looked like this and supported 8 megabytes of data. They quickly ran out of memory limiting issues and opted to just make enemies stronger as you progressed. They playtested the game with other students at UCSC. The game had pretty limited graphics, but players filled in the gaps of their own imagination. But they ran into a problem. Originally, there was no saving, but people wanted saving, so it was added. But Toy and Witchman found that people were constantly reloading saves to avoid death, so they changed how saves work, instead making it so your save file will be erased on reloading, creating a permadeath system. Rogue wasn't the first game with permadeath, as in the same year as Rogue's release, we had Pac-Man, which features permadeath, and permadeath has been around since Dungeons and & Dragons and in video games since the 70s. Wait, but I thought the 80s were the beginning of time. They also added a scoreboard so you can see how you rank compared to other players. But enough talking about Rogue, let's actually play it. <laughs> what the fuck is that?! In 1982, Toy got kicked out of UCSC because all his attention was going towards making Rogue and he suffered academically. He went to UCB and Witchman still helped for a while, but it got hard with a longer distance between them, so Toy took full control eventually. Development continued, and at UCB, he found the creator of the Curses Library, Ken Arnold. Toy gave him access to the source code of Rogue. Arnold helped him improve the interface of the game, and also helped with procedural generation. Rogue got pretty popular on the UCB servers, leading to it getting selected as one of the games included in the 1983 distribution of BSD. Rogue gained more and more popularity, but its distribution didn't include its source code, which Toy and Arnold kept after leaving UCB. This eventually put into open source in 1986. In 1984, Toy left UCB and joined Olivetti, a typewriting company. The company was creating the IBM PC. One of the administrators at Olivetti, John McLean, I mean, not fuck, John Lane, uh, who had seen and played Rogue before and proposed to Michael Toy. Just kidding, he proposed the idea of porting the game to IP. They made the company AI design and created ChatGPT. No, they didn't. Why the fuck did I say that? Uh, they started working on porting the game to the IBM and reworked a lot of the interface and changed some stuff around so they could avoid legal troubles with DD after releasing it commercially. They ported the game themselves, and while it did somewhat well, it didn't do great, mainly because they lacked a big distributor. Enter Epix, who stepped in and wanted to port the game to more consoles like the Macintosh. They developed more ports, and Witchman eventually joined AI Design to help work on Rogue once again. The vice president of publishing at Epix, Robert Brock, discovered that it was really hard to market Rogue traditionally, so he tried to push it into catalogs. The game sold well at the start, but quickly declined. The game was considered a commercial failure, which is weird for a game that spawned an entire genre. Epix went bankrupt in 1989, and AI Design disbanded. And there's not much else to the story of Rogue. Rogue didn't eventually get super popular and get billions of dollars, and it unfortunately led to the downfall of an entire company. So how did this spawn an entire genre if it failed? Remember how the game was popular in UCSC and UCB? Students really liked the game and wanted to make their own versions. A lot of games like Rogue were made, but two stuck out the most. Hack in 1982 and Moria in 1983. These two games spawned an entire family of clones and improved versions over the years, and thus began roguelikes. The name roguelike originated from Usenet in 1993, where people came up with the title of the genre to categorize games like Rogue and Moria that were different, but had a lot of similar core elements. Dozens of roguelikes would have been made over the years, but where the genre became a force to be reckoned with was in 2006. In 2006, an early alpha build of possibly one of the most influential roguelikes was released, Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress wasn't just a roguelike, it had three different modes, a colony building mode, whatever the fuck Legends mode was, and adventure mode, which was the roguelike mode. I've never played Dwarf Fortress, but it's been on my radar. It may look kinda crude when you look at its ASCII graphics, which are kinda changed with an option to have a normal tile map in its Steam release, but I've always kinda liked it. It has a certain charm to it. 
but why is this game so influential? The main mode of this game is the colony building mode, which features building simulation. You get to build and expand these communities with limited resources. It's also a base building game. And this went on to inspire one of the greatest games ever made, which in turn inspired hundreds of games to come after it, Minecraft. That's right, this complex, difficult, possibly cruel, lifelong passion project inspired the best-selling game of all time. Now, I'm not exactly sure how influential it was as a roguelike, but I think it's still worth a mention here. Remember how I said this game was an alpha in 2006? It started development in 2002, and you want to know when it finally released on Steam? They weren't lying when they said this was a lifelong passion project. But one of the first commercial successes in the roguelike genre was in 2008. 2008 was crazy for a couple of reasons. 2008 was crazy for a couple of reasons. On December 21st, 2008, Spelunky was released. It had some later releases, aka fucking 2012 on some consoles. I can't believe Spelunky single-handedly caused the crash of the economy in 2008. You son of a bitch, I love the economy! I've never played the original Spelunky, but I have played Spelunky 2. I fucking reek at this game. Uh, oh, fucking genius. This game is really difficult. It's probably the hardest roguelike I've played. Really good, though. It would help if my hands didn't ooze peanut butter every single time I played it. Spelunky did really well, selling over a million copies. It's recognized as one of the first rogue lights which are basically roguelikes, except when you die, you don't lose everything. But an even earlier example of a roguelite is Diablo. The Diablo series definitely took some inspiration from roguelikes and is considered the start of roguelites by a lot of different people. I haven't really played much Diablo. I played a bit of two and liked it, but that was a long time ago, so I can't really make a judgment. There's also Cube Cavern. Minecraft! But where roguelikes really took off was in 2011 with The Binding of Isaac. Come on, assholes. You knew we were going to talk about this game. It comes free as part of your house. Wait, what? Is that not normal? The Binding of Isaac released on September 28th, 2011. This game was made by Edmund McMillan, who created Super Meat Boy. After the release of Super Meat Boy, McMillan wanted to go back to his roots in game development and get a little weird. He took inspiration from his older projects like Host and Aether, and during a small game jam to get the creative juices flowing, he came up with The Binding of Isaac. He was inspired by the dungeons in the old NES Zelda games, and wanted to make a game based around those dungeons, and also wanted to make an endless experience, so he landed on the roguelike genre. By this point, McMillan was set financially for a while after the release of Super Meat Boy, so he wasn't exactly hoping for this game to do well. In fact, he was convinced it was going to fail, and then it became his most successful project. The original Flash version of this game released in a pretty broken state because McMillan didn't really want to spend too much time on a game that he thought was going to sell less than 100 copies. And then it far exceeded that, selling over a million copies a little over a year after release. In 2012, McMillan was approached by Nicholas, no, not me, who wanted to port the game to consoles. McMillan agreed, but on a few terms. He would remake the game from the ground up in a custom engine with a new free expansion, and he would be left out of the business side of the port as he had negative experiences with the business aspect of porting Super Meat Boy. And on November 4th, 2014, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth released. I fucking love this game! I'm terrible at it, but I think it might be one of my favorite games ever, at least in the top 20. There's so much to do with over 20 endings and 600 plus achievements to get. There's also the DLCs, Afterbirth, Afterbirth Plus, and Repentance, which is almost like an entirely new game. This game may drive you insane, though. Oh, hey, welcome. Don't know how you found my address. Please don't ever come back, but come in. You too. Um, this is the room of someone who survived playing a roguelike. I survived playing a roguelike. That's where I play roguelikes. Look at this. Fuck. So here's my bed. I cry here every single night, and oh, she's back. They get hungry at midnight. I think The Binding of Isaac is the definitive roguelike. This game was a major contributor to the rise of the genre. There's also Risk of Rain. I've never played the original Risk of Rain, so I can't really talk about it. But I can talk about Risk of Rain 2! Risk of Rain 2 is really fucking good. I haven't played enough of it, but I really like it. The whole difficulty increases as time goes on mechanic is really neat and makes you wary of your time. This game is really fun. But I can't say much more than that. I just haven't played it enough. The game is like ultra successful, selling over a million copies in its first month. It's sold over 4 million copies on PC, not even accounting for console sales. And then we have one of the more recent contributors to the success of roguelikes, Hades. Hades is a roguelite with early access starting in 2018 and fully releasing in 2020. It was a massive success, selling a million copies in the same month as its full launch. It won Best Indie Game at the Game Awards in 2020, which was so deserved. This game is really good. Hades is just fun. 
probably one of the most fun games I've ever played. I suck at it, but I think that's all fault of the game! It's easy to blame games for life's problems. Your entire family just died and The Simpsons Hit and Run is a real game. It's all your fault. Hades is great. Not perfect, but great. But there's a lot of roguelikes I haven't played. Like half the ones I've been talking about this whole time. I'm gonna talk about more roguelikes I haven't played. Wizard of Legend, holy fucking shit, this game looks fun. I've heard great things about Slay the Spire, so I'll get around to it eventually. Inscription, this game looks so interesting, and I've heard it's a must play for horror and roguelike fans. Enter the Gungeon, I have played this game, but for like an hour, so I won't really count that. Really fun though. Dead Cells, heard great things about this one too. Returnal also looks interesting. Hitman is not a fucking roguelike polygon! What the fuck are you talking about? Both Rogue Legacy games are big names in the genre. Never really see much about them, but I've heard the name around, so I should probably check them out. Darkest Dungeon, I've also played a tiny bit of. I have not nearly played enough of this game though, so I'll get around to it eventually. Faster Than Light looks difficult, but it looks intriguing. Overall, roguelikes are misery incarnate, but also incredibly enjoyable. The feeling of beating a roguelike for the first time is like none other. These games are difficult and rewarding, knowing that the hours and hours you've poured into this game have paid off. It's a legitimately great feeling that I don't get from other genres as much. I can definitely get them from other genres, how the Souls games exist. But with roguelikes, I can hate myself! I think a good roguelike is defined by two main traits, having a sense of progression, and being difficult, but rewarding. Isaac has a good sense of progression. As you get deeper, it gets more difficult. And the more endings you get, the more things you unlock, and the harder the game becomes. This is a pretty normal way to do progression in a roguelike, but that's not a bad thing. Isaac does it really well. Risk of Rain 2, obviously things get more difficult as you progress through areas, but you also have the time is difficulty mechanic, which adds a great sense of progression. The game also gets progressively more difficult in more ways than one. Spelunky. I get that reference. I'm a word user. Spelunky has a similar sense of progression to Isaac, except the entire game is pain and misery. This game really defined what it means to be a Spelunky. I do love Hades, but it does have a weaker sense of progression than other roguelikes in my opinion. Even as a roguelite, where you get more items that you get to keep, I don't feel an insane sense of progression. It's definitely there, don't get me wrong, but compared to Risk of Rain or Isaac, it's a little weaker. Roguelikes are really fun and they suck you in because they're difficult, but super rewarding when the dozens, maybe hundreds of hours you put into the game finally pay off and you give mom's art the finger. Isaac can 100% be super difficult but rewarding, but also sometimes it just isn't. Sometimes you get through a run because you were skillful. You dodge well, you had a good build, you, cause you chose items well, you learned the bosses, etc. Or you were Azazel and got the Lodovico technique in the first item room. Did you really learn how to fight that boss, or did you kill it in 5 seconds with a giant circle of death? Don't get me wrong, using these super powerful items is fun and you can still fuck up with them and die I have plenty of times. But it doesn't feel as rewarding as the game is significantly easier. But when this game is difficult, it's very rewarding. Hayes also kind of suffers at this trait. It's still a rewarding game, but you may also just have killed Megara because you died to her 70 times and now you have stronger weapons and three death defies. Similar with Isaac though, it can definitely be difficult and rewarding. Spelunky! Help me. So hypothetically, if you kill someone, are you a criminal? But you also have to keep the player guessing. This is where random generation usually comes in, which also randomizes enemies and bosses. Some games don't do this though, they have their own ways of keeping you guessing. I do love roguelikes, I also fucking hate them, but I will acknowledge a pretty big flaw in a lot of them. The story. Not that important, because you're not playing those games for the story, but... They're stupid, okay? A gun that can erase the past. The developers of Enter the Guns and came up with the story in two seconds. You go to a museum in a wizard costume and then go back in time to find an old wizard tournament. What the fuck were you thinking, Wizard of Legend? Spelunky, you go into a cave. On the moon. Slay the spire. You have to slay the spire. That is the story. The roguelikes that I think have a good story are Isaac, Hades, and Risk of Rain. Isaac has a pretty dark story. A mother tries to kill her own child in the name of God. <laughs> Damn. Edmund, what the fuck? Hades is a good story because Zagreus is like the best protagonist ever. And Risk of Rain has some surprisingly in-depth lore spread throughout. There's also an inscription, but again, I've never played it, so I can't really say anything about it. I heard the story's really good, though. In the end, roguelikes are the definitive genre to play if you want to feel like there's a cosmic horror eating away at your soul and you're slowly losing what makes you human. And also great to play to feel like, damn, I just did that. I just said fuck you to Hundo and Spelunky. These games are... The ones to play to hate yourself, and also the ones to play to basically live real life, but not really. Wait, so if a roguelike has permadeath and random generation, then hypothetically- THE SIMS IS A ROGUELIKE! God, I just realized, do I even play video games? Most of this video has just been me talking about games I haven't played. 
Yet somehow, roguelikes are still one of my favorite genres of games. I'm a fraud! I shouldn't be a gamer! I should be a chef! Well, just learned that you can't cook french fries instead of the Constitution of the United States.